Hi, we're having a look here at the game Gettysburg by Hampton Newson. It comes as a PDF in um, a privately produced um, offering uh, within a publication called Mead's Turn, the Mine Run Campaign and Gettysburg. So this is using a system which is available in Hampton Newson's other works, at least the um, at All Hazards, the Cold Harbour campaign uh, game, which I is available again as a PDF um, uh, and which I haven't have played previously and have enjoyed. I can't remember it because it was many years ago, but I think this might be a higher level game in the sense that this is divisional level. Now, um, this one, I'd heard because I enjoyed his other games so much, I, I heard about this and I very much enjoy collecting Gettysburg games to compare contrast I'm in no way an expert on Gettysburg I'm still just a, quite a newbie everything I've really learned about Gettysburg is through war games designers comments and so forth and magazine articles I have yet to read a book on Gettysburg I kind of pick things up as and when I can I never really have sort of you know never um so as I come by things so I haven't found that book yet but um Gettysburg is a fantastic subject, that classic meeting engagement um, between two giants, a sort of a, a legend and a giant of, of force, as it were, and this sort of accidental, tumultuous turn of events. But anyway, um, so I heard that Hampton Newson had this Gettysburg game, um, a small mapper, we have here an A4 or letter size sheet, um, uh, containing the whole uh, Gettysburg um, scenario. We have here Cemetery Ridge, Cemetery Hill, got Culp's Hill here, Penders Hill here. Um, we've got something called, I think that's is that Oaks Hill, um, Little Round Top, um, Seminary Ridge, Macpherson's Ridge. Uh, we have em Emmitsburg Road, Tannytown Road, of course, Chambersburg Pike, Baltimore Pike. And you've obviously got various um, forested areas in between the town itself here. Um, so I was really interested in this game, and uh, but the game it was not available. He never published it, but I heard it was around. And um, on request to him himself, very kindly sent it to me, my, to me via email, um, obviously as a PDF. Uh, on the condition that you know I don't um, release it to anyone else. Um, uh, I'm releasing this video because my understanding is that, that they don't pass on the game because he he wants to control it and he wanted some feedback on it so part of my feedback on it to him is this coverage and if he's alright with it I'm going to make it available for wider usage uh, of wider viewing um, so um, just a quick mention is um, when I have PDF games obviously um, I generally have crappy equipment and my colour was running out so this is sort of very bland and I use felt it for these uh, to mark these commanding hills um, so called so um, these aren't the perfect components that he offered also I to save colour I did not print out I, as I remember he gave offered lots of chits in the colours of the um, similar to these chits, which did come out fine, in the colours of the various cores, because these are um, tracker markers for each core. You've got the uh, federal cores there and the um, confederates there. And I I just um, printed them out, I just used these ones that I had and I've put colours on them um, myself. So it's not representative of, you know, his artwork and so forth like that, but I... I think it's um, why I wanted to make this video is I think this is a, an extremely interesting treatment of Gettysburg and it's a very um, easy to get in assist, get into system but particularly this Gettysburg as well has uh, quite a few nuances which I think make it of note and worthwhile of coverage and, and for um, people to be interested in. So what do we have here? Well, we have the classic beginning, uh, six thirty a.m. turn. Um, up here I have um the game turn chart. So you've got victory points chart here, 
you have uh, four day turns and one night turn and then three days so um, potentially you've got 15 turns in this game and you've got the victory points and some special rules for Gettysburg because the mine run campaign uses the same rules with, without these special ones and then the victory levels so you start at 50 victory points which is a draw but it's the top end of a draw um, towards the Federals. Um, if you go down below 41 victory points, you start getting Confederate victories. Above 50 victory points, you get Federal victories. Now, um, so how do you win that, gain those victory points? Well, this hex on Seminary Ridge is worth five victory points to the Federals. This hex of Cemetery Hill is worth Oh, no, sorry, that's 15 victory points to the Federals, and that is 5 victory points to the Federals. To the um, Confederates, Cemetery Hill is worth 10. Then Powers Hill back here, so you're heading towards the um, supply lines of the Federals, is worth 20, and that 15 to the Confederates. They get nothing for holding Seminary Ridge. They would just deny it to the um, Federals. Oh, hang on, I'm just plugging my thing in here. Okay. Then, um, so that's one little nuance, but, you know, nothing uh, that you don't find in other Gettysburg games. The other one is that um, the Confederates get f three victory points for taking a s casualty step from the Confederates, and then the reverse, the Federals are worth four victory points per step to the... Um, confederate side so the Confe confederates get one victory point more per step they take from the federals um so it's that's good so the the confederates get more from for inflicting step losses i mean you also get one victory points for a supply wagon or a um cavalry force of which there's only these two confederate uh, federal ones in the whole game so we have here classic setup. We have Gamble and Devin. Um, in fact, I'm gonna this one. I'm gonna set them up together within one hex of that Seminary Ridge victory point hex, and then you have Heth's division coming on here. Now I'm gonna. Um, this will be my third playing of the game. The first was many years ago. I don't remember it. My second, I just played it, and it was it was quick and great so I decided to do this video and play again. Um, I'm going to be playing and explaining as we go along and um, we'll see how that works. Um, the f so one thing of, of note I think is that um, okay so we have some of the is it the second or third quarter I forget but anyway coming on here and Harrisburg Road here. Yes, yeah, so we have Rhodes of the Second Corps coming on here, and Early of the Second Corps coming on here, um, in the first day. So, and what I found in the the game I just played was that it's very easy for the uh, Confederates to first take this hill, which challenges this, um, this hill, and then um, they so the Confederates come round here very quickly, so they get sort of. They, they flank Gettysburg as as it were. I don't know how historical that is. Um, my last game ended with um, the uh, sixth corps, federal sixth corps coming up here, and amongst other the, the the divisions, the federal divisions are generally weaker than. In fact, they're all weaker than um, the Confederate divisions. So though some Confederate divisions are slightly weak in st number of steps. So you need kind of more of them to challenge the Confederates. and But anyway, it was the 6th um, Corps which effectively came on quite late here and pushed the Confederates back. They had taken here, and the game ended with the Confederates just having claimed Cemetery Hill before nightfall on July the 3rd. But um, due to various other factors, it was a draw, but a slim draw. Um, edging towards a confederate victory even but yeah i don't know how how normal that is and how, how people would chew the cutter over and that and that it's very easy for the confederates to to bring on 
um, early and even raise if you choose to threaten the Federals right back here on the first day. So that's what we're fighting for. Now the next thing to notice is that um, uh, the units, uh, Hess vision here, this denotes his, you see the figures, oh, there's three figures, that denotes its third step. Could potentially be eight steps, but he comes on in this um, scenario game, the Gettysburg one, I guess he's got eight, uh, four steps in, there's uh, two more parts to his steps down there. In the um, mine run, he can go up to four steps. But anyway, here he's got three, um, which is six strength, and then five effectiveness, and then eight movement points. Now, they all have eight movement points, except the cavalry, they have 13. So that the way that works is um, one movement point along the road. Um, because these are divisions, and each hex is, I think it was half a mile across, um, uh, you're not worrying about sort of tactical niceties. You do have facing, you have zones of control, you have facing, um, but you only have to worry about that at the end. So it's one movement point along roads. However, if you go into clear, that's two movement points. So it's just done that way, and three movement points in woods and town has no effect on that movement. Um, special rules for um, Gettysburg, uh, the Willoughby Run has no effect. Marsh Creek uh, is, has some effect on combat and movement, uh, but you probably won't be fighting up around there. And then Rock Creek is all the way across here, it's just one movement point to move across no effect on combat. So that's the terrain effects essentially um, uh, in um, uh, there's no combat effects for any of the terrain you see here except for these um, commanding ground and the slopes. But I think I'll mention them as, as I get to them in gameplay. And gameplay is going to be quite swift, so I hope that won't take too long. So the objectives for the Confederates are to gain this point and this point, or at minimum these two points, and inflict um, more casualties on the uh, Federals than they have taken. And the Confederates is essentially to stop, that the Federal objects are to keep all of these from the Confederates and don't lose as many strength points as the Confederates have lost. Now, a quick analysis of the victory points is that um, we start at base 50 a draw. If um, the Confederates take cemetery and powers, so that's here and here, we're going to ignore this for now, um, considering that essentially the um, Confederates have two choices, one whether to concentrate here or one to concentrate on um, Hood's, the long streets, the first core flanking manoeuvre towards here. Um, so that's going to be hard to take, I think. Um, it depends. I, I, I tried for this on the last one. Maybe I'll try for this on this one. But anyway, considering we, we take that one out, um, the Confederates with cemetery and powers, they will get bring the victory points down to 20. Now, if each side has inflicted five steps on each other, that's a net minus five in the Confederate advantage, brings that down to 15, which is an automatic Confederate victory. On the other hand, if the Federals hold these two, we stand at 55 victory points. Again, on equal step losses, net minus five is 50, so that's a draw. So, um. If the Federals hold all of these, they don't have cemetery, Seminary Ridge, and they're on each side equal step losses, it's a draw. Um, if, which tells us that for the Federals to win, that forces um, them to either retake or hold this or inflict more losses upon the Confederates. If 
At any point, the Confederates hold all the uh, sorry the Federals hold all the victory points, and they have inflicted more step losses on the um, Confederates. Then they will get an automatic victory. So to get anything other than a draw, um, the Federals are going to be have to be quite aggressive, or they're going to have to be quite handy in bringing the Confederates on to attack them and not suffering comparable losses. Now that might be in terms of gameplay, so as um, to ask the uh, Federal player to do better than historically, you, you cannot just end up holding these. If, on the other hand, the Confederates take um, point D and the, all these are all, uh, it doesn't matter if they've got these, it's worth nothing to them as long as the Federals don't have it and the Federals hold these two, then the Confederates, uh, they wouldn't get an automatic victory, but they would have a Confederate um, light victory at the end of the game. If, in fact, um, they, they had inflicted comparable step losses, that would be another minus five points. And they would get a large victory. The way the step loss victory points are geared, the wide the, the greater the number of step losses inflicted to either side, the bigger the margin the Federals need. So for example, if um the Confederates have lost five the Federals, sorry, have lost five steps, um that would be minus twenty in the Confederates' favour. If but then you would need seven steps for plus twenty one to balance that out in the Federal's favour. If it's six and five, then we end up with a net of minus two in the Confederate's favour. Um, so if we have um, five Federal casualties, that's minus 20, and eight Confederate casualties, that's plus four in the Federal's favour. So you need that difference of between three and up really to begin to get a difference for the Federals in the victory points. So the Federals really cannot afford to lose any of this ground and must inflict more losses than they take. So that is my challenge. Um, as I said, there was a Confederate victory the last game. Um, I'm going to have to work harder for the Federals in this one to um, counter that. Without further ado, I've only got a few more minutes, I can do this now. Let's start with a first chip draw. And this is how the turns go. So we're starting at 6.30 a.m. turn, three and a half hours per turn. And that's the uh, Union. So um, they are not going to move. They can start within one hex of these. I originally started them like that, the last game. The advantage there would... So um, if he moves up to here, to move out of a zone of control, he needs two movement points. And you cannot move out of a zone of control into another zone of control and attack. You can move into another zone of control, but you cannot attack thereafter that turn. So there might have been advantage to having... So he would stop in the zone of control. This one would be free to manoeuvre. There's no um, flanking or... Um, that kind of bonus in this game because we're at divisional level I guess we're talking about um, the effectiveness rating of the unit will determine whether they're good at that kind of flanking maneuver or not so anyway for this one I'm going to stack them together just to give them a bit more defensive power as they've only got one strength point each but effectiveness of five which is very good higher than any of the other except for one or two maybe others um, federal divisions. So eight movement points, one, two, three, four, five, for example, bang. Could try and be clever, one, uh, one two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not enough to carry on up. It's still only two movement points. It's only three movement points and the forest's not going up the slopes. Other interesting point to note is if you're on a slope and um, your opponent fights you, if he does not push you off it, then he has to retreat back. No matter what his um, other uh, combat effect, if he has to retreat back one hex 
and it takes a fatigue loss for that. So what that means is you, you don't, in zone of control, you don't have to attack. But as the as a defender on the slope, you're not going to have units sitting around you like that. They're either going to have pushed you off the slope or you're going to have forced them back. That's another interesting nuance which makes this very interesting Gettysburg mini Gettysburg treatment. So um, I think because I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try for the uh, southern strategy with the um, Confederates. I think Hess is going to move around this way to draw um, Union units up here or Federals as they're called here. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hang on, he's on six strength. So if we go into here, let's have a quick look at the combat charts. So excuse my poor um, printouting again, lack of ink. But um, so we have the terrain affecting attack or defender, no effect, um, no river bridges here. Commanding ground is the only terrain that's going to have effect. And that's these hexes are commanding ground. The normal slopes are not such. Um, then uh, fatigue is going to have an effect, but no one's tired at the moment. Night attack, we're not in night. Um, we're not in problems with supply at the moment. And there's no earthworks in the Gettysburg one. No one's disorganized, in which case they wouldn't be able to fight. So terrain's not going to come into it at the moment. But So we've got six against two, so that's three to one. That's going to be a plus three dice roll modifier. Then the morale modifier, we look at the difference between their effectiveness. Here they are the same. If you have two or more differential, then you're going to get a plus one or minus one mod. Tax from multiple hexes, we don't have that. Then we go straight, we roll a d6, and we're looking at plus three, because we're on, no, plus two, because we're on three to one. Um, so we could potentially, we're going to get between attacker and defender, stay, stay, stay. Advance, 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 retreat. So it's half and half, stay or advance. But essentially what we want is one of these higher ones where the defender has a, a modifier on the combat's effects table. So that's if you advance, retreat or stay, plus your modifier, um, advance, retreat or stay, what happens? Then you roll again for the combat effect, once each for the attacker and defender. So the attacker... So advance, retreat, stay, attack or defender. What we're looking for is these C casualties because the hope would be here is that uh, the only real reason to fight these is to cause a step loss which is going to get a victory point because we know that these are going to leave in uh, three turns, I believe it is, out of the game. So they're just laying us or as the Confederates, their own use for us is for that victory point game, you might say, but you know that's our considerations. So um, if we're on a stay, we need a less than one, or if we're on a retreat, we need a one or less than one. Um, and so there's sort of, again, a half 50% chance of a modifier to get that low. So it's going to be slim pickings just for one or two victory points. It's not really going to happen. So it's not worth it. Let's just move around then. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then um, I could spend one movement point to turn my facing again. Um, but I don't think that's necessary. I'm covered there. So we pull them. That's the end of them. Oh. No, it's not. So Heth has moved because he moved. He takes a fatigue. So some of the start fatigues already, that's because they come on later. So they've been marching um, more to get to where we are. Then just a quick look at the movement and fatigue sheet. So every time a core activates, the units can either take mobile actions, as many as they like, 
stationary or rest actions. Generally you're only going to take one, maybe two from each. Um, so we've done movement, fatigue up one level, we did that. We could do a forced march, that would be interesting. Um, going to fatigue, but if you want to get somewhere quick, I might try some of that. I didn't do it in my last game. Uh, you might get fatigued in combat, so you could you can move and then fight. Cavalry might retreat. So movement, force march, combat. Um, for movement, if it was stationary actions, we could change facing without moving. Uh, not in earthworks. No, no. Straggler recovery, resupply, and that's a night turn. And then these are resting essentially for regaining fatigue against stragglers recovery so i'm not going to be doing anything but movement and potentially combat is there any benefit force marching we would get five according to our effectiveness rating that many more movement points so we could go three four five no, three four five six we could get there or if we did this we could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Could potentially get there facing that way. And that's interesting, having completely outflanked them. We don't have to worry about them attacking our rear because they get no benefit for that. So the only question is, how far do they pull back? I think we're going to do that. So Heth takes another fatigue hit for doing that. And he has to take an effectiveness check or lose a straggler. Ah, that's the risk I forgot about. The straggler is a whole step. So you roll a d6, add your effectiveness. If it's higher than 6, you've done it. So fortunately, we just made it. Um, so... End of their activation. So now, obviously, the only other chit left. Oh, sorry, that was theirs. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I did, because they, they weren't moving anywhere. So they went first. So the only thing that you can happen there is, can they respond to that? In these, at this point, they can't. So we move on to the next turn. We throw these back in the chit cup, and we check for reinforcements. So the reinforcements of these, we've got Rhodes will be coming on here. So he's in the uh, second course, so his chit's gone in the cup. Oh, sorry, a bit of confusion. I should have had the third core chit rather than the second core in the... It's because this is supposed to be dark green and that's black. They look so similar. You easily get them mixed up. Um... And then we've got the Federal First Corps coming on. We've got Double Day here, and Wadsworth and Robinson here. Now these are all only two-step divisions. Um, so they take, say, one casualty and one straggler, and they're what's called smashed, or two casualties. They will be completely gone. Or two stragglers, in fact, they could be smashed. So we've now got four chits in the cup. I'm not looking, I'm just um, going to draw. And that is the cavalry again. So they go first. So here's the interest of chit pull and these um, three and a half hour turns. Um, do they withdraw back to here? To block them or do they withdraw all the way back to here or, or maybe spread out here to keep Hef and potentially getting all the way to Cemetery Hill before these fellows can get on. I mean they could come up and one two three four five six seven eight they might take a hit try and even go into with a force march and go into combat to drive him off. Not necessarily necessary. The question really is would they get a chip pull So he won't be able to get there, even with a forced, forced march. Um, but they might be able to if they get the chip pull before he does. Um, it's too risky, so I think these fellows are going to move back. So the reasoning being that the, the um, lone Confederate division up here, the um, 
Union would be able to retake it, but you know that could be a bloody fight. Really, what we want is to have that position, so that um hopefully keep it, the Confederates thrown back, while we get more um Federals coming up to reinforce it to make it harder for the Confederates to take, rather than taking it off them. So, Devon and Gamble are going to come back, so that will be, one, two, three, four, five, and then six to turn around. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In fact, they're going to go the, like that. So um, they each take a fatigue, and that will be them. Next chip pull is the second core. Um, so that's Rhodes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So he could come in to the outskirts of Gettysburg. Um, but interestingly, he would, he would, you have to directly face at least one of your attackers to, at your defenders to attack and being there, he would not be directly facing. He don't, doesn't have enough movement points to turn around unless he takes a forced march. He's got effectiveness of five. So again, it's not too risky, but is it worth it at this point? Um, Against these, we might get a uh, advance of three. You could get advance of one, two, or three. If we get three, they would have retreat of three. That's hexes, and we could advance three hexes onto Cemetery Hill. So let's do that. Um, he's going for a forced march. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven goes for forced march. Makes it seven, eight, nine. And he, he attacks. He might take fatigue in the attack. He might not. It does depend. So, so we're on a plus three dice draw modifier because of the odds. That's the only one we have. Oh, dear. So that's only five. We really want a six or six plus. Five is an advance of one. Retreat of one. So he retreats one. He advances one. And then we roll on the combat effects chart. So, um... Advance of one, retreat of one, no dice roll modder up far on this, which is not great. So uh, the attack advanced, I roll a four. So what we read is he's disorganized, takes fatigue and a supply loss. So Rose is disorganized. Takes a fatigue, oh, movement and then that combat fatigue and up here a supply loss. Everybody can uh, has two supply on the third supply. They're out of the spending and they won't be able to attack after that. And then until they resupply, we'll see resupply wagons coming on as reinforcements. Um, OK, so Gamble's role was also a modified five. That's good because it low is bad. High is good. So his retreat. Uh, D F S, so essentially the same as, as the four, of the advance. So he's. Gamble one supply, one fatigue, and he also is disorganized. So that's, on the second core. That's Rhodes. Now we next chip is third core. Hills third core. We only have Heath. Um, he could push on to Cemetery Hill. And he does have Rose near. Now, I don't know if Gettysburg folks are screaming, this is ridiculous. They would never have got that far so soon. Where's the reinforcements? It's just the, in the chip pole in this these big time span turns. Um, but anyway, so Heath's moving up. So fatigue loss for movement, he's going to attack. He's six against one, so that's six to one. So we're at the same plus three. So I roll a four, that's seven, so that's six plus. So yes, that we have the advance of three and retreat of three. So one, two, three. So Devon's going to take up Culp's Hill, commanding position, but one, two. He doesn't have to advance all the way. He's taking that cemetery hill. Oh no, you have to stop in a zone of control. Dag nabbit.
that maybe that attack was worthless. Okay, yeah, so he has to stop. He can change facing at the end of advance, so he could change the face him, but no. What we're going to do is change facing down this way um, for these fellows coming in. In fact, maybe that way. Okay. Um, and then we have to roll for the combat effects. So it's plus two for the advance. That's four. Oh, so we saw that. That's a fatigue supply and disorganized. Oh yeah, so he's on half strength if anyone attacks him. And the defender or the retreater, five. Oh, that's good. Minus two is three. So he's disorganized one step loss. So... He loses a step. I also mark it. Oh no, that's only a straggler. So no, sorry, it's not a step loss. That's a straggler loss. Casualty would. I mean, they're both step losses, but that is permanent casualties. These are stragglers. So yes, I mark it. Devin loses one straggler. The, the difference being that. Both ways you, you go down a step, but you can bring but stragglers back. Um, two fatigue and one supply. So he's doubly fatigued and loses a supply for that. And then the last chit in the cup will, of course, be the first federal first core. And so these ones one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They've got effectiveness of four and five respectively. Um, that could get them one, two, three, four, not into Cemetery Hill. Oh, now something I've forgotten is you need two movement points to fight. Did I have enough in the fights I've just done? I, I'm not sure. I think so I did because they both... Um, Force March, didn't they? Let's just say say that I they did. So anyway, these ones won't. They were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're not gonna risk a force march. Although Robinson doesn't have much risk, but the Federals really can't afford stragglers at this early in the game. And you know, it's just who gets the chip or who can get there first. They're disorganized too. No, let's let's get in there. Because, okay, so Robinson's going for a forced march. Does it handily. I'll just mark their um, fatigues. One, two, three, four. One, two. Okay, it, he'll stay there. Um, I don't want to risk with Wadsworth. Okay, and he'll just come straight in there. I don't think they're going to attack, but effectively, right, he's there. Um, in their turn, I believe they're going to have to move out. And he's he's completely surrounded. He's 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 in bad way, isn't he? Yeah, so effectively when they activate, they're going to have to move away because he's on the up on the slope of a high ground hex. Not commanding ground, but still high ground. So he's going to suffer from that because he won't be able to... I think he's going to have to take a step loss unless he fights his way out through them. Okay, so that's the end of the 10 a.m. turn. We go up to the 1... PM turn on the turn track, and I will have to continue this later. Just a quick sneak peek. So, um, the next turn we will have Pender and Johnson from third and second core coming in on there, and early from the second core coming in on there. See how that can um, resolve that. Then we've got Barlow. Uh, Shirts and Steinway coming on Emmett's Bird and Tannytown Road from the 11th core. So we got another extra chip in the cup. And the next turn, the 5 pm turn, um, the cavalry units will withdraw.
but they're still in play now.